welcome. I speak about the new world vultures and Dr. Mern will speak about the old world vultures, but they have certain overlap. Um, here, my first slide is the total habit, uh, the total um, area of the new world vultures. And as you see, it goes all the way to Tierra del Fuego and just up into Canada. Um, they, their, their, their range you can see on the map, the height range is they go to an enormous height. Condors um, will go to the top of the highest peak in the Americas, which happens to be Aconcagua, but there are other peaks similarly high with snow fields around them. Their habitat range is from desert to seashore to forest to savanna, extremely general. And some, some of the vultures uh, have no need of a sense of smell, and some of them very much do. So the, the ones that very much do tend to be the ones in close country, uh, forested areas, and the ones that don't uh, need a sense of smell less and therefore don't have one. They are descended from eagles and hawks. It used to be thought they were descended from storks, but opinion has altered um, based on sound scientific evidence. Um, They've, uh, they've developed, they've evolved uh, with a leaning towards economy of effort. Therefore, they, um, they live their lives as, as quietly and as unaggressively as they can. They move as economically as they can. And uh, this, is, uh, th th this is how they work. Hawks and eagles, as you know, they attack their prey, living and and eat it. The vultures do not. They are scavengers pretty well entirely. There's one species out of the seven which has um, rather nastier manners than the rest, and they do attack an ailing calf, for instance, uh, with a view to eating it. And so that, that's the exception to the rule. But in general, the New World vultures have been hugely maligned over the past 200 years. And um, the, the result is that they've been diminished in number and their usefulness hasn't been properly appreciated during that time. Uh, partly it's um, just silliness. Buffon, who a, a, we must all acknowledge as a great naturalist, described them as uh, cowardly, uh, disgusting, all this kind of thing. And there was, even in the 50s of, of the last century, there was a very eminent uh, ornithologist called Giraudet who described them as ignobly filthy and all that sort of thing, anthropomorphic rubbish, and, and it did harm because it supported the farmers who wished to do away with them, and the, particularly the cattle breeding folk who were absolutely fine about poisoning them with meat with strychnine in it, or they would be poisoning another creature also with strychnine, such as a wolf or a coyote, the vultures that would then come down and eat the poisoned carcass and just drop dead. So the numbers were very greatly de decreased by this misunderstanding. And I'm sorry to tell you that the misunderstanding endures today. There are plenty of people who are prejudiced against them, and it's um, pitiful. And rarely I shall touch on it at the end of my talk. The only hopeful way of dealing with this is through education, and in my opinion, primary education. And uh, you will all have noticed that children are now listened to by their parents when they come home with some new fact, and so there is hope there. This is the largest of them. There are, in the seven species, there are two condors. There's this one, and there is its range in green on the map. And uh, it, it's it's a f the painting of it is full size, so as you can imagine, it's quite a big canvas. And they, uh, the other of the two, this one is in reasonable con uh, condition as to numbers. The, we don't want to lose any more, but they are holding out pretty well. There are some places where they, they were very much reduced, Colombia being an example. Uh, this is the California condor, which, on the other hand, was reduced to 22 specimens in, I think, 1986. 
and it was thought the best idea was to capture the lot, which they did, and brought them into captivity where they have since bred, and there are now 400, so they're not doing badly, but uh, it sounds better than it really is. Very few have been breeding in the wild, so it's a matter of hope, and it's the most expensive bird um, restoration program there's ever been, millions of dollars. However, a lot of people have followed it with keen interest, and their interest has spread out to the other species and to uh, natural life in general. So that's that. Um, they are, as I said, all scavengers, and they keep themselves extremely clean, not only inside, uh, not only outside, but inside. They, they, they will destroy pathogens in, in their inside and that's uh, bacteria in general. They, uh, it's thought possible that they will do away with viral infections, but that's, I don't think that's ever been uh, proved so far. There was a hope that they would be, uh, they would literally eat Ebola, the, that awful disease we had the other day in the African tropics. It's not proved, but I think something may be made of it, and it may be possible to isolate whatever it is inside them that does have this effect on pathogens and use it uh, commercially. So, who's to say? They, uh, they have extremely weak feet, which rather proves the case for them when it comes to the idea of them destroying cattle and sheep. They're not capable of doing it. They are, they, the back toe, the hallux, is, is almost vestigial, and it seems to me at any rate that its only purpose is to help with the preening of their blue. went out of office in 1910, and there they still were. And they had very little to do, you know, so I suppose they didn't get worn out by over-exercise at any rate. And that would have made them 70 years old, I think. Probably 80, in fact, because they were, I assume they weren't chicks when they were brought from Chile to Mexico. So it's a long, a long life when all goes well. And the smaller ones don't live that long, but they do, you very likely would get 25 years out of the, the, the shortest lived one in the wild and maybe 30, 35 in captivity. Uh, one of their techniques uh, for keeping cool is that they they dung on their feet and it's like a chalk fridge I don't know if any of you have um, ever seen a chalk fridge but when I was a child they were about and you poured water in at the top and the evaporation of the water made the fridge work and you know, the butter stayed hard and all this kind of thing and th the vultures do the same it also gets rid of pathogens because the sunshine on the, ch on the, the, the chalky element on their feet uh, kills the bacteria. Now we've done the Andean condor and we've done the California condor. Alarmingly, the, um, the, the California condor uh, is now, there's one of its populations of released ones is in a place where the bridge has been broken. So no um, help can come if, if help is needed to look after them or keep an eye on them, and I'm very much afraid somebody might want to poach one, because there are still people in the world who like the idea of having a mounted bird. I think Roland Ward was collapsed long ago, but it did, uh, which was a firm that stuffed animals in London, and uh, people are still after them. And I'm afraid they would probably steal an egg if they could such people, supposing they exist, but um, they do exist. Whether they do there, I can't tell you. Um, that is the king vulture. I drew, did the drawings for that in Peru, and uh, the, or of wild ones. I was lucky enough to see them twice, and uh, I've seen many in captivity, which is part of my technique for painting them. I could do that. A rather lovely bird. Those are two meters of a wingspan. The, the, the Andean condor, being the largest, has a, an 11 foot wingspan. Humboldt said he thought he saw a 14 foot one, but I don't know if it's possible that he could have done. Um, however, there was a prehistoric 
Condor, which had a 30-foot wingspan. Can you imagine? They dug it up, a fossil in Argentina. Now, the American black vulture, this is the one with the bad manners. And um, it's uh, what you describe, it's called the American black vulture, as it says, and it's got an enormous range. I found the best place to study them was music, municipal rubbish heaps. Perfect, because they're completely unafraid of the attendants. And so they uh, you know, more or less stay still while you draw them. Next one. This is, the, this is the one that can smell gas, the turkey vulture. They migrate, and I, I'm afraid I've never seen them doing it, but I, it's one of the great natural history sites of the world, is to be in the Isthmus of Pan Panama. They, they migrate from the, uh, the northern part of America to the southern part and back, and thousands and thousands of them go, go across the Isthmus. They can't fly over the sea because you don't get thermal air currents going upwards, and therefore they stay to the narrow land. This is one of the cathartic vultures, a greater yellow-headed lovely creature, also studied in Peru. It sat still for a long time, luckily, so uh, they don't always. And this is the lesser yellow-headed vulture. Now the threats to them are as I've already said, really, what more can one say? Human beings, we've wrecked it for them. If you were in one of the Spanish colonies in the 17th century and you hurt a vulture, you were quite likely to be hanged for it because they knew that they were cleaning the place up. They had, as everywhere did, rubbish heaps in those days, and the vultures would come down and have a clean up there. They would clean up carcasses and then fly away, in, in their case, up they flew back up up into the Andes and and in that way were protected. Not anymore, you know, it's, it's um, too disgraceful. And then, as I said, poisoning, hunting still, still people who do it, and these particular birds, I mean, and what is called micro-trash, and this wasn't really recognized until, I suppose, something like 40 years ago. They'll eat the top, you know, those tin things that you pull off the top of a drinks tin, if, if a vulture eats one of those, it's very likely the end. They're very susceptible to that sort of thing. The uh, ammunition used by hunters will, say, kill a bear. The vulture will come and eat the, um, the carcass of the bear and be killed by the lead. And there is now uh, lead-free ammunition in use, which is said to be much better. But any little thing, and some uh, vultures are very keen on sparkly things, rather like magpies. Are. <coughs> if they eat a sparkly thing, that could be the end too. But rarely prejudice. I mean, people have still not got it that they are other that they're other than useful creatures, and I think extremely beautiful. And we have got, we, I say we, but uh, organizations I have to do with do work in schools in the countries where these creatures live, and it works. The children are enthused and interested, and they talk about it to the next generation up. So it's all really very good. So uh, we'll have questions at the end. So I'm through, and if you care to take my place.